front lines. We welcome our viewers from across the United States and Canada, from Europe and the Middle East, Australia and South America, and of course, in Armenia and Artsakh. They found him face down, dead on an Istanbul street. It was broad daylight. He had been shot three times at point blank range in the back of the head. As he lay on the pavement, the assassin fled, shouting, I shot the infidel, I shot the infidel. That was 15 years ago today. He was killed right in front of the offices at Agos, an Armenian newspaper he founded in April, 1996. He was its chief editor. When they buried Harantink, over 100,000 people marched in the streets of Istanbul chanting, we are all Armenians. We are all Haran Dink. Haran Dink was an advocate of truth in a country that was, and still is, afraid of it. He was prosecuted three times for offending Turkishness under the infamous Article 301 of the Turkish Penal Code. In an interview with Reuters just months before his assassination, Haran Dink spoke about his advocacy for truth and reflected about the numerous prosecutions and threats against him for speaking of the Armenian genocide so openly and plainly in Turkey. He said, of course I'm saying it's a genocide because its consequences show it to be true and label it so. We see that people who had lived on this soil for 4,000 years were exterminated by these events. Today, on the 15th anniversary of Hiran Dink's assassination, we are going to discuss his legacy and his impact on the Armenian diaspora and the Armenian identity. We're also going to explore what he would have thought about the events that have gripped Armenia and the Armenian world since the 2020 war, Turkey's involvement in that war and the plight of the indigenous Armenians of Artsakh today. And with that, I will turn it over to Garo to, to introduce our guest today. Thank you, Karnik. Uh, uh, good day in the uh, Artsakh and Armenia uh, universe, and good day everywhere else in the Armenian diaspora. Uh, it is a very bittersweet moment for me uh, because um, it is January 19 in Istanbul. It's January 19 in a lot of places, Stepanagert, Yerevan, and elsewhere. Still January 18, evening, late evening in the United States. It's bittersweet because I was introduced to the myth, the legend, the man, the reality of Haran Tink by a very, very dear friend of mine, Edwin Minasian, and neither Haran Dink for 15 years nor Edwin Minassian now for some 120 days are with us physically. It is very bittersweet for me to welcome Aris Nalchi, a bright, brilliant Armenian patriot who knew, knew well, both men, Haran Dink and what became Haran Dink's messenger in the United States in the personification of Edwin Minassian. It is very bittersweet for me because while year after year I had the distinct pleasure, fortune, and honor to be part of the organization of Istanbul Armenians as they commemorated Haran Dink's memory led by none other than Edwin Minassian. It is now the second year in a row as a result of the coronavirus pandemic restrictions that that gathering is once again delayed, but not to be ever held in the physical presence of Edwin Minassian who brought Haran Dink to life, perhaps like no other, other than who we are about to enjoy for the next 45 minutes or an hour, hopefully, Aris Nalchi. Who is Aris Nalchi? aside from being my young Akhbarik, as I would like to refer to him and as I endear myself hearing him refer to me as Akhbarik, Haran Dink, uh, protege in many ways, 
a graduate of Yetro Naganaska in Varjaran and Mira Metzian, has worked at Ados with Harang Dink until his assassination. Then thereafter, he has served as editor and redactor in chief at Ados. He is currently a regular contributor there. He has founded the first Armenian TV show in Turkey at IMC Turkish TV channel until the Turkish state shut down that channel. He contributes to many Turkish newspapers and writes at artigercek.com. He's a TV presenter at RT, has worked on an NGO project for normalization of relations between Armenia and Turkey. And he is the recipient of the Herantink Medal of Freedom Award by the Organization of Istanbul Armenians. I was there, I witnessed it, and he deserves it like no other. Aris. It's, it's, this, this is very touching moment for me to remember Edwin Parik and at the same time talking about uh, Baron Rand with you uh, and Karnik. Uh, first time after we lost Edwin. It's it's uh, it's an it's a it's a very uh, sad moment, but at the same time, as you said, we have to uh, pass the message. No? Yes. And, you know, I think that that's a really great place to start, Adis, is that message. And um, I want to ask you, what, in your opinion, was Haran Ding's true message? What was, what was his purpose? What is it that he really wanted to achieve? You know, lately, uh, I watched a documentary uh, prepared by one of France's good friends, uh, Umit Kıvanç in Turkey, which I think that they're subtitling now in English and other languages. Uh, and probably we will be able to uh, see it in a couple of uh, days. In there, uh, every year, Umit Kıvanç is a documenter in Turkey. Uh, every year he was preparing some documentaries about Hrant and first year, uh, uh, what happened about the case, etc. This year, he was focused on uh, Huron's message because mm, we all understood uh, that this is 15 years past now. This is the 15th year. I can't imagine when I go back that 15 years past already and I feel the anger uh, like the first day when I, uh, I heard the news when I was there. And uh, now, like this year's uh, documentary, we they're, they're, we understood that with the new generation, the, this generation Z and uh, who is growing up, they actually don't know what we are talking about because they didn't know, they they didn't knew uh, Hrant thing. So it was important to pass the message, and he found some uh, videos of him in the conferences and uh, cut some sound bites uh, from Hrant's uh, uh, lectures. And uh, I also remembered many of them, which I was presented there, because every time that Baron Rant was going to lecture in Istanbul, we were there, there to uh, shoot some pictures and take notes to write the news at Agos. We were doing our news, actually. So... Uh, Every time I remember uh, what was uh, happening in, th in that meetings, uh, in the public meetings, was also uh, some messages. Uh, like Grant was saying uh, that he was a he's a good Armenian and also he's a good leftist. Mm -hmm. So uh, he was always saying that. So when it when these two comes together, uh, there is trouble. There is always trouble. There was always trouble, and there is still trouble. Uh, and this is this is the something like that we learned, uh, and this is something that that he passed also to us. That know that okay, even to trying to carry the message of him or his kind or his ideology is not going to be easy for years and years. These fifteen years were were not easy. None of, for none of us, not for the journal, for Agos, not for, uh, of course, the, I'm not even saying the family members and the foundation, but any people who were involved 
uh, with Armenian community and journal after Ranting's Ranting assassination. For me, what, what was his message that he had many, many things to say about everything. He was also a member of the peace group in Mi Middle East. So he went to uh, Middle Eastern countries to also pass the message of how they can establish the peace in Middle East. Also, he was, uh, he uh, he, he was uh, talking uh, to diaspora to be able to make a connection that, to, that uh, we diasporians uh, can lose <clears throat> in years. Because when you start to, you always have a image of uh, Turkey or the, uh, the place that you born, but uh, it changes in years. So after uh, Agos founded, and uh, every time that he visited the diasporian community, he was also taking a letter with him, like a letter with him from the homeland, from the home, coming from the village. Mm -hmm. uh, and way back to the villages, let's say the Muslim Armenians, uh, heathen Armenians, whatever we call, every time that he was going, he, he was also transferring that, yeah, we know, Armenian community knows, Armenian world knows that you exist. And this gives to also people in there uh, who stayed, uh, gives the hope and the strength to, to, to stay alive and to continue their life. And also to Armenia, and it's like a three uh, three way bridge it's like a tripod diaspora diaspora turkey armenia and also to armenia uh, he was also saying that we exist we exist in turkey still we exist maybe i'm talking today to you from brussels but let's not forget the armenian community exists in turkey still they still have schools churches and they uh, they are closer than many more communities. I, I see this when I'm coming to Europe, when I came to Europe more and more. You, we, we, uh, we know that in Middle East, when uh, uh, under Islamic uh, rules in many countries, Armenians and uh, minority Christians, they are always uh, st strict together, stick together and they have more cultural ties. And let's not forget, we have 17 schools in Turkey and uh, people are, the, what we are talking in diaspora in all the world that uh, an existential, uh, about existential war about uh, as, as a nation and as, as, a, uh, as a language, Western Armenian too, we learn in there. We learn, we are still teaching this language to our kids in there and these kids either that way or this way. They're talking and using this language during their uh, daily life. So uh, this message was passing to also to Armenia and saying that they can be the bridge uh, to Armenians in Turkey. And that is, that is important. And he was, I think, the, the one who was uh, able to translate also uh, the message because transferring the message for me is like translating it. The first times that I was working in, in with, with Turkey Armenia pro, Armenia projects, that the most uh, common issue was uh, what Armenia was saying. What uh, Turkey was not understanding. They didn't understand because the diplomatic language, even even with the translations, it doesn't pass. They didn't. They didn't. They don't get it. They don't get the emotion that we have. And what Turkey uh, side is say? Turkish side is saying. Armenia was not uh, getting it because we uh, like like Rand's, uh book uh, that he was preparing and uh, he wasn't able to finish it. But after his uh, assassination, Ranting Foundation published as a first publish uh, publication that uh, two uh, clo uh, two close nations, two far neighbors. This is this is this is what it is. And to be able to transfer the message, he was able to translate in the in the good way uh, to make good for both sides. That is that was more uh, more most important thing I think for the new generation too, for the next generation too. Today, what I see from uh, the new generation who didn't met with her, I think, or who who was 
six-year-old, five-year-old when he was assassinated. Uh, they they just know him from the books and uh, from the from this kind of lectures or meetings that we are doing. And this is important that how we transfer it. It's like uh, how you how you transfer and translate. It will be the image in their in their mind. Uh, you know, I listened to um, Garo Pailan give a speech uh, maybe hours ago. I don't know how many hours ago, yeah. but I saw it a few hours ago. Uh, and I struggled to understand, though I do understand the language not well, but I wrote down what I thought, something that Garo Pailan said that uh, was really telling. He said, but in those days, the darkness inside the state decided to silence Hrant Dink. Yeah. Uh, it made me think, Hrant Dink, someone who was prosecuted multiple times for insulting Turkishness, the infamous 301 article that uh, then they talk about repealing it. Uh, but here we are, the darkness inside the state, which decided to silence her on Dink, the messenger of peace, her on Dink, mind you, the messenger of coexistence, neighbors close but so far, is now engaged in normalization talks with its neighbor. Uh, you uh, have an interesting uh, background as a journalist and as one that understands all nuances that occur that are Armenian-esque in nature and how it affects the Armenian community in Turkey, the Armenian uh, community that has migrated out of Western Armenia. What do you think Haran Think would say about these talks? And how do you assess these talks going back as far back as the 1993 talks, if you will? Is Garo Pailan talking about the darkness inside the state of yesteryear? Or is that darkness still within the state? Uh, let, let me let me uh, try to answer in many ways. First, I, I watched uh, uh, Garo Pailan's um, this speech today in the parliament. Yes, you're right. It was a couple of hours ago. Uh, uh, but let me let, in in this in my mind, where, what we see that first of all. Let's think. Darkness in the state, in Turkish state, is always there. Mm -hmm. In 93, it was there. Today, it's there. And uh, in 1915, it was there. 23, at the beginning, the construction uh, of the state, it was there. Mm -hmm. Taner Akcham this week spoke uh, at Durde platform for granting commemoration, and he wrote an article in, uh, which was published uh, in August 2. He's saying that until we decide, until we uh, understand, until Turkey understands that the new republic has to be established on Hrantink's uh, ideology, on the Hrantink's words, we will never be, okay, it's not going to be a real republic. It's not going to be a real state. So the state, the darkness was there. Let's we are talking about normalization, uh, as you said, Garo. And the uh, the person who was uh, doing uh, much more everything about this normalization after uh, Hrant, Osman Kavala, is in prison now. Mm -hmm. The person, the person who uh, the the politician uh, who first uh, expressed himself and talked eight minutes in the Turkish Parliament when Garo was not there yet. Mm -hmm. A Kurdish uh, party leader, Selahattin Demirtas, who talked about Armenian genocide for eight minutes in the parliament, is in jail. So in this darkness, 
we are talking about the normalization. What was Surant going to be saying? I always try to be uh, try to be uh, away from this kind of questions because he was a person. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm maybe the, the student of him, but I'm not able to see what he's able to see in this. Probably he was going to see both sides, mm-hmm. and uh, probably he was going to have so much much insights uh, thanks to him. We, with these connections, with these other Akhbariks like you, that who are involved in this process today, normalization process, uh, they're calling us as journalists, they trust us, etc. And they're saying that, okay, we are, to, we are like this talking, uh, but actually on the back doors, uh, we, we, there, there are some other things happening. Mm. But we cannot write it, huh, Aris? You know, well, you, you should not write, but you know. So actually, these messages, these kind of messages are make me think that, okay, they're giving a message to me to be able to translate it to public, not to write directly, but to be able to say it. This is, this is, this is the place of the journalist. That's why we are in between. That's, let's, let's talk about, wait, let, let me go back to Sabia Gökçen history, uh, mm-hmm. story. Uh, because of Sabia Gökçen publication, and we were, uh, we, uh, Agos claimed and said that Sabia Gökçen was Armenian, is Armenian, an Armenian orphan. Uh, the, the old Turkish public was ag- turned against the newspaper and against uh, Hrant Dink. This was a public propaganda. And uh, this was also another, uh, another information which came to uh, Hrant Dink, he published. He didn't know, he didn't know Sabia Gökçen personally. But somebody told us to publish or do something, and then it happens. It turned out something else. What Garo is saying today, also for me, is something that uh, they, they're trying to accuse Garo, open some uh, co- uh, courts, uh, t- and take t- take his immunity. Uh, everything they're trying to do this, and they will continue to do this. This is a struggle for Turkish state which they're doing it. And I always remember uh, from this beginning of this whole normalization process, uh, I always remember Turgut Özal, ancient uh, Turkish uh, Turkish president, Turgut Özal's uh, and Demirel's uh, words. If something is going to be done, we are going to do it, not the others. If if, If you have to be leftist, I have to be, I can be leftist, not the others. This is what they were telling. So if somebody is going to uh, make a normalization, they will not let the second track or diplomatic uh, second track people to make it or NGOs to make it. So they want to do it themselves. But this is because because they want the victory for themselves. If they want to do it, by the way, that's another question. This is, this is, this comes with another with another issue that uh, that the, the the biggest opposition party in Turkey, the Kemalist party, CHP, was saying that they're going to uh, face with their, uh, they're going to make peace with their past, not face, mm-hmm. make peace. So with their past, when they were saying this, when the Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu was saying this, he was mentioning the uh, uh, Greek pogroms, 1955 uh, pogroms, and he was mentioning Dersim and everything he was mentioning in 1980, military coup, uh, until the genocide. He didn't mention that. But uh, even in this state, we were talking in between us in Turkey with, Tur- with our Turkish colleagues that after a politician says this, the, 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 what is our role to push more? Mm-hmm. You said this, you should do this. Come with another schedule. You should do this too. You said that you want to make peace, but what is the difference between peace and facing uh, with your fault, with your, uh, with your everything? And during his time, everything happened. He is the he is the representative of Turkish uh, state in the at the beginning CHP party. Right. So this is what is happening now. But uh, when if we are going to talk about Turkey, uh, Turkey Armenia normalization too. There are many, many points that we should also see. 
about uh, Turkey state point. And this is a good opportunity also because many people were asking what I'm writing in uh, Turkish, tweeting about the information or etc. Why I'm not doing it in English or Armenian because I didn't have time. This is an opportunity to uh, to pass these messages like I'm saying it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I went with Turkish journals to Armenia in 2010. And be, uh, before uh, after I came back, so we, I brought some Armenian journalists to Turkey, which are we are today. These are all some editors in chief in there. Some of them are uh, in parliament in Armenia. In, in Turkey, they're in parliament. And these people has some connections and they're saying, they're calling. They're saying that, okay, you know, Aris, this is happening like this. Uh, but actually there is something uh, else going on. So let's keep the hope in the base point. Uh, what, what's happening now? Yeah, Aris, um, I wanted to, uh, to dig in a little bit uh, about where we were. Uh, you brought up some names when you were talking about Demirtas in 2012. A decade has passed. Um, in that decade since, uh, since I would say there was, a, there was an opening uh, where the, obviously the issue, of, at least in the Armenian diaspora, the issue of hidden Armenians had taken a, uh, a, uh, a real storm. Uh, people were very much interested. Uh, the uh, book My Grandmother was published by Fetin uh, um, uh, Chetin. And, and I think that there was a lot of interest in the diaspora in Western Armenian heritage, Western Armenian presence. Your trips and works in the villages uh, were, were widely shared. People were very much interested in that. Um, I want you to take us from that period to what we are seeing now. Um, you know, Martin Luther King uh, said, and not exactly these words, but he said that uh, that uh, justice is a is a precondition to true peace. That you can't have true peace unless you have uh, justice. Um, I want you to tell me a little bit about what what inroads. Uh, the realization of the Armenian presence, the Armenian, uh, uh, the Armenian history, not only of the genocide, but of development in the country since the genocide. Um, what impact, what inroads have there been within Turkish society at large? Where, where is Turkish society on the Armenian issue? I'm not talking necessarily about the government. I'm curious to hear what 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 is Turkish society thinking today, as opposed to what it was thinking in 2012? Has there been progress? Is it uh, is is the uh, the rhetoric of the government taking over, um, or is there an opposition that is that that can survive Erdogan? Okay, let's let's let me tell you something interesting that until that time uh, it didn't go back. In these 10 years, always the knowledge of uh, uh, Armenian genocide in Turkish public, I'm talking not about Armenians in Turkey, but the knowledge uh, of the Armenian genocide is growing up. There are more books published. There are more Armenians, tell, uh, hidden Armenians calling themselves Armenians, even in this point. Mm. Uh, even in this point, imagine uh, Hemshina Hayer and or the Dersim Armenians and uh, there are some many other places. People uh, are uh, having an uh, uh, having an awakening in, in 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 them. This is we are talking about public mm -hmm. as much as uh, governmental pressure, the presidential pressure uh, is going up. That much people are uh, that much people are getting closer to find themselves. Of course, let's not forget. Of course, in this matter, uh, when they're pumping the hate speech in public, let's not. Uh, I'm not talking that. Yes, it grew up. It grew up like if it was just five percent people, uh, five percent of the population was uh, was aware what happened in 1915. Now it is 2025, maybe. Maybe we can even reach the <clears throat> reach some nationalist uh, national movement too, movements members too. But 
let's not forget this government, which uh, was elected uh, lately, IKP MHP, was uh, has also or uh, still has minimum thirty five percent vote, which who votes directly to them. But this doesn't mean that their voters, the people who vote for them, also shares the same co uh, context about Armenian genocide or about history. People are voting uh, for economical reasons or what will happen in the future. If you imagine uh, today we are talking in Turkey, uh, in Turkey we are talking about uh, people who are voting for Islamic uh, the parties or nationalist parties because they're frightened that if they go away, the, the opposition which will come is going to punish them because they're uh, Muslims. This is what they believe. Mm -hmm. And this is why uh, the hate speech is really, is, it's, it's more, uh, we, we're, we're, it's more available to push people to uh, hate speech or hate crimes. This is why for the last 10 years, there is a rise of hate crimes against Armenian churches, etc. Let me tell. Let me give you another example. Maybe you saw the uh, on uh, social media or our viewers. There is an uh, there there is an uh, wheeled person, young woman, uh, who expressed herself in 2017 in commemoration of ranting the 19th of January, expressed herself as an Armenian, and she said in an interview that day that I feel myself Armenian and I'm so sorry because I didn't speak up for my Armenian friends, Armenian people in this country before. I'm ashamed of my history, she said. Okay, this is 2017. Today, she's, an, uh, she's working for Istanbul municipality, which is in the opposition hand. And the government is opening a court saying that she has terrorist thoughts. Uh, so this is a terrorist thought, what, and this is again a, a, exactly what they are trying to do. This is exactly what they're trying to push. Even people from inside, if they have an awakening, if they even say that they have a sympathy, this is not a sympathy. This is an awakening and saying that mm -hmm. she's sorry. She feels sorry and ashamed. This is this is important for me. This is a person, young person, and uh, and even to. Uh, demonize her. Uh, this is the way what, how it happens. But at the same time, uh, when this all happens, uh, I, the, before this whole uh, issue, or uh, the, since that I know uh, myself and assistant, I'm working at Agos. It's the first time that I see that in many uh, cities in Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, people are doing business. Uh, with Armenians, they're especially uh, looking for an Armenian, a Dersim Armenian, Dersim uh, person who has a Turkish name, who is Muslim on the official papers, is trying to do business uh, from an Armenian in Switzerland. And during that business, he's also saying that I want to do this because I'm Armenian. Wow. So, and uh, I want to do the. He, he's not working with Turks. He's not working with uh, Greeks. He's not working with others or Hemshinsis. They're more, of, more often, even the border is closed, even the, during the Karabakh war, more oftenly Hemshin Armenians are traveling to Armenia these days. Mm. They're, they have businesses in there. They are asking citizenship in Armenia. Uh, there, is a, there is a saying, I didn't confirm it, but many uh, people uh, from Turkey, they applied for Armenian citizenship. And it seems that for last couple of years, it became the number became more than three thousand. So if I'm, I was thinking, okay, maybe it was the Armenia, uh, it was the Armenians from Turkey who were trying to get out of the country, etc. Yeah, there are some cases like that, like Heiko Badat or Sevan Nishanyan, etc. But when I digged it with uh, some friends from Armenia. Uh, Okay, Luis uh, Rafi Hermon Arax, who was working in Armen Press before he uh, died, uh, he was also reaching some uh, information that these people who are applying to Armenian citizenship, they're, they're not uh, Armenians from Turkey. They have Turkish names and uh, they lived in Eastern Turkey. 
so they're coming from Hemshin, Mush, that, that kind of places. The thing is, they found themselves because they weren't able, these people weren't able to express themselves in the Turkish Arme the Armenian community in Turkey. They, they, they found their identity to become Armenian citizen. Mm. This, is, this, is, this is also another case. There are some studies now going on about this issue that why they prefer to be Armenia, Armenian, not to become really the uh, nation, uh, the part of the diaspora nation. And there, there are interesting answers you know, in these uh, enquetes, in these surveys. Uh, so where are we in general that let's not forget we have Garo Pailan in the uh, parliament and thanks to him, every time, every 19th of January, uh, let's start with that. Every 24th April, he is giving some uh, some sites in the parliament. We are able to see our Armenian intellectuals' uh, pancards in the parliament. This is an this this is this is awakening thing. This is even that we you know what I said in ten years ago when Erdogan first just uh, mentioned in a letter, say uh, graved for all the people in Ottoman time. Uh, who died in 1950, all the Ottoman citizens, without mentioning Armenian genocide or Armenians. So we, when he was doing this speech, uh, doing this letter, writing this letter, I was saying that this is a good thing. We should criticize what he did because he didn't mention about genocide, etc. But this is a good thing because in it, this news went to every house in Turkey, and Turkey is a country where people watch TV more than eight hours a day, and it goes to every house, and they said, okay, why the president is talking about this now? And it gives another thing. Even, imagine, they pumped up this news about uh, during the 44-day war in Karabakh. They were pumping the news against uh, Armenians, hate against Armenians, etc. It, they were just able to rise some hate crimes in between that 30 person, 35 person. But what happened in that other 65? Okay, if they're pumping up this news, there is something wrong about this. You know, Anis, I want to ask you about that in particular because you raise, you raise an interesting point. Um, if we look back at uh, 2012, uh, Demir Tash, uh, the mayor of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Dikran Agert, uh, the 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 view of the large the, the Kurdish intelligentsia with respect to the Armenian genocide, right? I mean, there was there was a clear movement towards acceptance. There was a clear movement towards um, uh, towards accountability on behalf of the Kurdish power establishment, whether it was HDP or or through Kurdish society generally. What was the view of Kurds in Turkey about the war in Artsakh? Do you have any information about how they viewed the war in Artsakh? Okay, first, uh, that I, I have some uh, information because in information, let's see that I talk with some politicians uh, in and out Turkey, uh, some politicians who were uh, exiled uh, from the country. Uh, let's see, first, let me tell you that Kurds had an awakening about Armenian genocide because their leaders were talking about it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this first. Because Ahmed Turk, a really uh, known, respected uh, politic figure, uh, who, mm, the political figure uh, who was talking about Armenians and saying that, yeah, uh, our Ashiret, our uh, clan also uh, stayed on some Armenian lands uh, mm -hmm. that Kurds had an awakening. But let's not forget one thing. They had an awakening, but they didn't want it to give the lands. That's mm -hmm. another thing. <laughs> let's separate this. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they wanted to deal in another way. That is another issue that how they were presented in their minds, how they were going to be able to solve this issue with Armenians. That's another thing. About Karabakh War, uh, first of all, the, the involvement on the, of the mercenaries, uh, Syrians, uh, that is something that they knew. Uh, mm -hmm. Kurds, they knew already from Rojava, from Syria. And they knew it was going to happen to Karabakh. Uh, they, they were feeling that it was going to happen to Karabakh too. 
and they ha they had a um, emotional and a, a connection with Armenians because Armenians and Syriacs also supported them in uh, by military uh, forces in Rojava. Still in Kamishle in Rojava, mm -hmm. there there are Armenians living there, and they're making it uh, they're, they're making it clear that they're fighting together against this Islamic State. When they're when we are saying Islamic State, they're uh, talking about an Islamic threat coming from north and south, both mm -hmm. sides. So the thing is, in all these uh, issues, all the politicians in uh, that I talked, in, uh, they they're. What happens in Karabakh? What happened in Karabakh? For example, the, polit the Kurdish politicians, the Kurdish origin politicians in European Parliament, they supported the bill uh, to uh, that to ask uh, Turkish uh, uh, soldiers get out from Karabakh to ask the mercenaries, mm. uh, and uh, the and they are also supporting uh, during the genocide bill. Let's not forget about it. But this is the diaspora. But what is uh, what is in the other hand that they 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 think they're going uh, they're expressing themselves that this is a uh, uh, humanitarian crisis and hate crime and a, they, it's a genocide even wow uh, they're, they're, it's their way to express what I'm I'm trying to uh, mm -hmm. summarize their uh, thoughts uh, and they're saying it and in their TV channels also they're saying it. Uh, the, they, they're saying it and uh, this is not because they're just against the Turkish government this is not against uh, just because they're, they don't like Erdogan, this is not just like that this is because they know what they're dealing for, they lost also their people by fighting this and they know how it can be difficult, violent and they know how this can be even cancelled on earth Remember what happens in Rojava now. Nobody talks about it. Yeah, they are. They are still in Turkey. They are still selling Yezidi women in Antep and in some vill some uh, some cities. And Turkish government is, I don't know if they're chasing them or not. They're just uh, arresting some people. Then a couple of days later, they're releasing them. Mm. So this is the deep dark matter in the state in 100 years ago it was the genocide then it was the uh, it was pogroms etc but that deep dark point always stays, stays there this is what uh, this is what garo pailan and others and we are fighting against but let's not forget this is this is an awakening maybe we weren't close uh, like this before uh, we weren't close to each other like this before this is this struggle uh, pushed us to uh, get in touch and get closer. Even me, you, and Garo, we, we we like this. We met, and this is how they met too. And this is how also gives some uh, gives some insight insights that if the border is open, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, people are talking now. But let's not forget the Kurds who wants to invest in Armenia. They're already investing. They're already in there. They don't have their borders. They don't have they don't have their you know struggle like the others because they're open minded. Where they're come when they're coming, they know where to go. It's it's an interesting another story that every uh, businessman, Kurdish businessman who I am meeting, uh, who I see, is saying that where where I am asking where do you go in Armenia to visit? Yeah, we went to the thermals, etc. Then we came back to Dijernagopert. Okay, it's it's something. It's their yeah. This is this is what how they how they look. Uh, you know, Aris, I I was raised in Beirut, and I remember uh, there was a generation um, that had hailed from certain parts of Western Armenia, and the elders uh, were, were were what we refer to as Terkahos. Uh, they were uh, they were discouraged and uh, not really permitted so much to speak in their native tongue uh, and 
you know, it's refreshing uh, to hear and to see uh, that Hamshenahais and and uh, and others who uh, embrace their uh, ancestral origin and their true identity, if you will, their uh, DNA-driven identity. Uh, it makes me uh, wonder. Uh, you spoke about uh, the, the reciprocal visits of journalists to Armenia and journalists to Turkey. Mm -hmm. And you referred to, you alluded to the fact that some of those people are in parliament, or perhaps in both countries' parliaments. Yeah. I think I know some of the people that you're, you're referring to. Uh, that might, one might think, okay, you know what? Dialogue is dialogue. You know, I don't have to agree with the person, but I can agree to disagree and have a discussion and see if we can get somewhere that we can coexist. Uh, but then, you know, you, you take that against the backdrop of the 44 day war, the offensive onto Artsakh. And I hear you say that, which I had, I had forgotten, I had tried to forget, at least not, not the war, but, but the rhetoric, the Turkish propaganda machinery, the anti-Armenian hatred, uh, all the social media fervor that was out very strong at that time and still out there. Now you come full circle and they talk about normalization talks without preconditions. They talk about um, uh, arm's length. Uh, you know, if we get to, uh, uh, as long as we respect each other's, you know, uh, boundaries, we'll, you know, we'll get somewhere. But meanwhile, I see Azerbaijani media and state apparatus talking about, hey, we're confident that Turkey is going to keep Azerbaijani rights in mind when they're having these discussions or normalization talks with Armenia. It's a lot to digest and to process and to have any faith in the, in the so-called process. And oddly enough, now I'm hearing in Armenian circles from some who I like and respect that way, you know what, we should not be uh, dismissive. We should not criticize the Armenia representative and that's fine. You know, I I'm not about criticizing this individual versus that individual, but let's not lose sight of what is going on. We are now engaged in normalization talks with a country, a neighbor so close yet so far, who killed two million of us, who sent its special forces and took over after the first few days of the Artsakh war, took over for the Azerbaijani military command and changed the dynamic of that uh, military offensive. But now we're all supposed to just kumbaya, get together, have a conversation and go forward. Do you, do you, Aris, if this, you know, forget all that I said, do you have faith that both countries will come to some kind of a normalization of relations as an outcome of these talks? Let me tell you uh, something. I have uh, the, all this I, I, I see right here. I will say uh, that a couple of years ago uh, in an interview, I told that one day the in Turkey, we will have the most important and the great academic works about Armenian genocide. Hmm. Everything will be done, okay? All, every, come, every university is working on that. And even now there are so much teases and works about genocide, but Turkey doesn't recognize it. 
they're changing their and what did the uh, Davutoğlu uh, and uh, Erdogan tried 10 years ago to changing the uh, meaning of the genocide for people and presenting it some like kind of a sushi bowl or etc to people to to not say the word but yani it's go it's okay uh, we know it so that is what i under, what I, I that is what what was my hope that is that means that for me everybody every single person in the country turkey they know about the genocide they know what happened really mm. they're just they just have to deny like uh, if i'm going back to taner akcham's article what i said they have to deny otherwise the the republic is collapsed this is nowhere that is a that is a that is a stupid thing uh, project ottoman time they turned into turkish republic but do i really uh, believe do i have a belief on uh, normalization process what i think that the the process is uh, now is between the governments and that's why for example i see and i hear that both sides are trying to uh, push diaspora away yes of course this is a, Tur a turkish effort which doesn't want to co uh, contribute for genocide which doesn't want to talk about genocide what happens but also for a state it, i'm just thinking you can have war uh, you can have but you can have relations uh, the, board, the, the Turkey and Greek Greece has uh, many problems, but the border is open. Uh, in this uh, kind of, uh, the, the, in this way, I think Azerbaijan and Armenia are more close than Armenia and Turkey, mm. because they they have a common thirty year story, last thirty year story that they can understand each other. They they know what they're talking about daily life. With Turkey and Armenia, there is a lot. Uh, there is also a lot, and uh, let's see the Russian effect too, mm. and Sovietic effect. Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia. There were Transcaucasian uh, countries in social uh, so Sovietic time. They have more common, and let's maybe many people will not like it, but let's let's see another issue that maybe the border is not going to be open, mm -hmm. but the relations are going to be uh, established. Maybe the concerns about, you know, we, I'm hearing and reading too that the Turk, uh, 80 million Turkish economy is going to invade Armenia and people are going to come, etc. Maybe when the border is, stays uh, closed, uh, that's the way. I don't know if the government of Armenia, if they, they're not able to uh, deal with this pressure coming from uh, Turkey, with this economical power coming from Turkey, maybe it's going to be the border like that but the meaning of the the sincerely meaning of it there is no way that if turkey is sincere about this normalization the first day that uh, we lost the war the first day that that the, uh, we lost that devastating war they had to open the border because that was the condition for turkish government for years mm. so what is the sincere? No, they're not sincere. And I don't expect from a Turkish government, any of Turkish government, neither this, neither upcoming Turkish government, neither opposition, neither Kemalists, neither Kurds. I don't expect any sincere move if we are not talking really about opening borders first. If there is no precondition, open the borders first, then let's talk. There will be preconditions. We all know that. Armenia and Turkey, we are open cards. We know what Turks wants. They know what Armenians wants. They're just trying to deal with it. And let's not forget and that there is an uh, upcoming election thing in Turkey and Erdogan is squeezed in many ways in uh, Turkish Lira is getting, uh, losing power. So they're trying to, er Erdogan needs a story, mm. a peace story how he established the first uh, in 2000s, how he became power, that I will make peace with everybody. He was making peace officially the, on TV. He was making peace with LGBT, LGBT uh, plus. 
Now he's against. He was making peace with uh, women. He was making peace with Armenians when he was municipal of Istanbul. Mm. Now it turned away. So uh, in that black hole, uh, that black matter in Turkish the state is always going to be there. And I don't feel uh, that if the opposition is coming and if the opposition, I'm saying that I'm, uh, I'm putting the HDP one side, but if the other opposition are, is coming on power, I don't feel that this is going to be happening uh, also in the future. Mm -hmm. So let's not forget that that hole is going to be always there, but we should act cleverly, which is what, which condition is for the for the good of uh, the state of Armenia. And, and you know, I cannot I cannot know that, and the state has to know that because they are talking, and uh, the this go the iconic. Yeah, there is one thing that you do know really well, Aris, and I'm going to ask you about this because uh, you know a lot of things very well, but this one in particular, there should be a lesson that we as the state is one thing, but we as a nation, which has existed much longer than the state, this republic or any previous republic, there is a lesson to be learned for Armenia, its government, its NGOs, its society, its citizens, its voters, its diaspora, its everybody. All Armenians have to know the story that I'm going to ask you to tell right now. And that is what happens in this situation with the idea of recognition of boundaries? Uh, what is the fate of Artsakh if we are not clever? Because you've been to all those villages in Western Armenia. What happens to Artsakh if we are not clever? If we don't understand what we're doing, or we go about what we're doing in a less than uh, than uh, thoroughly uh, thought out manner, because we are, it is it's it's really unfathomable for me. I almost don't believe. I cannot believe that we, as an Armenian nation, sit here today discussing issues of economics, and and I understand those those are very important issues. But what is at risk at Artsakh, in Artsakh, based on what you've seen in Western Armenia? Maybe you can tell us what the risks are so that, that we can really appreciate what Hiran Dink's words were with respect to be there being justice before there is any true peace. Tell us what, what your experiences in Western Armenia uh, bring to mind for you about the risks facing Artsakh if our diplomacy and our uh, state action is not undertaken cleverly. Sure, uh, you will not like it. <laughs> why, why, people will not like it, but let's see that it's going to be a, 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 like Artsakh is going to be uh, an Armenian uh, population in Azerbaijan, like Armenians in Turkey, like in Turkey. Uh, I'm not separating them because some there are some people are saying that okay it's more historic than uh, the other etc. Armenians were there before Ottoman too, in, during the Ottoman time too, and uh, Artsakh, in uh, Artsakh also uh, Armenians were there too before. Uh, what will happen that we will probably the state uh, power is going to pressure uh, and you will be a minority. And that's going to happen. What is going to happen in every country in the world? If you are a minority, you will fight for your language, fight for your religion, fight for your fight to be able to at least uh, make your kids learning the language, which this fight started already. Now we are hearing more and more Russian schools in Arsakh. Uh, and uh, then mm, the identity uh, is going to be uh, loosened up. Uh, because if you uh, lose your your language and you will be able to continue your cultural life maybe in associations, yes, you're in. You have already uh, based many uh, associations or etc. But the cultural heritage is going to be uh, forgotten in in years, and we are going to come to a point that existential existential uh, weakness. Uh, what what I mean with the existential weakness that we are not be able to, we are not going to be able to create ourselves. Uh, I'm, I'm, 
this is this is this is pity what I'm uh, go, going to say, but Western Armenian and our Turkey our Armenians in Turkey are having this fight for a long time. It's not the numbers are not rising and the numbers are not lying. The, the students who are going to Armenian schools are maybe the same for last five years, but we are late, we are taking the students for last five years, but we are not taking that okay. How many kids are born? How many are coming to the schools? How many are that is rising? More than 50% of the kids are going to either Turkish schools or either uh, college or private schools to not go into the state system. This is going to happen the same way in there. And they are going to go to our Azerbaijani schools. You know, and I'm happy that, you know, you're raising this issue based on your experience of what you've seen in Turkey and Western Armenia, because the rhetoric is very similar, right? There is a fascist rhetoric uh, in, in Azerbaijan. There's a fascist rhetoric in Turkey. And the whole goal of, uh, of fascism is demanding adherence to the governmental narrative. And I, I wanted to, uh, you know, this, the reason I asked this question is because why do we have to wait until you know, the knife hits the bone until we're at that stage for us to realize that we need to draw some lines, even in normalization talks, even in our relationships uh, with between diaspora and the Republic, uh, among our, the Armenian nation, among NGOs, that we need to draw some lines that the, that the end result if there is no stand taken on Artsakh, the end result at best is what you described. At worst, it's going to be genocide. It's not that we had we we weren't we 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 did not know that this is an existential threat. It's amazing to me that during the war we spoke of it being an existential war, but now that it's over, the war, at least the active hostilities are over, the idea of existential threat is not in our discourse anymore. Why is it, how, how can we move from an existential war that we lost to not being in an existential state right now? We are in an existential situation right now with a good section of the Armenian population. It's not, an, it's not a small amount of, a, a, you know, 150,000 people is a big chunk of the Armenian population and living on indigenous land. These are the things that we were talking about, uh, you know, in 2012 with the hidden Armenians, Armenians living on their own indigenous land. Well, we have that situation and why, you know, knowing what could happen if we are not clever and intelligent about our stand, the stand that we have to take on Artsakh, not just with respect to politics, uh, but also in, in terms of a diasporan and a, and a state and a na national agenda. I think every Armenian should be invested in the idea that Artsakh must stand and status for, Ar for Artsakh must be uh, an outcome, must be the outcome. And that, you know, and, and having Artsakh under Azerbaijani rule anyway, even inadvertently by making uh, decisions with respect to boundaries and recognizing boundaries and territorial integrity, um, that we cannot fall for these types of uh, uh, these types of circumstances, which will inevitably lead to what you're talking about, what we've seen in Western Armenia, what we're seeing in Turkey. I, I just, I don't understand how, what it will take. And maybe, Gato, you are uh, much more the activist when it comes to uh, understanding the, the beat on the ground. You know, what is it going to take? And I hate to kind of make this a more general conversation, but why do we have to wait till the, the knife hits the bone before we're able to realize what it is that we're up against. I mean, this is another historic moment and we're living in existential moments still. What are your, th I mean, Gato, what are your thoughts? I mean, when, when, we as a, when are we as a nation going to realize where we're standing and the risks that are, fa that are being faced in Aqsa? There's a famous uh, Armenian saying, Kanaga voskorin chahasats martik chen sava azgar. Right? Well, okay, here's the thing. We all felt the collective um, urgency. We collectively felt the urgency of the moment during the 44 day war. We said, we believed, and we felt the existential threat. We remembered the words of Monte, you know, 
as goes Artsakh, so goes Armenia. And as went Artsakh, a large chunk of it, so have we seen chunks of Armenia now occupied by foreign armed forces. The problem we have is we think we are all conquering, all overcoming as a nation. Of course, after all, we have overcome genocide. After all, we have resurrected ourselves from the ashes of Derzor to the very vibrant diasporan communities of Aleppo, of Beirut, uh, and beyond. But, but when there was civil war in Beirut, there was a collective urgency of maintaining our, our uh, survival, our viability, uh, with the least amount of losses. When Artsakh has been under attack, when Artsakh was uh, facing uh, that which it was facing in the uh, era of the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had the Gharapa movement. The war is lost. People are at cafes in Yerevan, I hear. I haven't been there in a while. Uh, and until this is sad to say, some people say, until the war comes around the opera square, I will not be that concerned. Well, yesterday was Shushi. Tomorrow, maybe Zangezur. The day before yesterday was all of Western Armenia. What's it gonna take, Karnik? It's gonna take some leadership quite frankly. It's going to take leadership, not just in the homeland. It's going to take leadership in the diaspora. It's going to take rallying around a common cause. You know, here in the United States, organizations come together in January and they talk about, hey, we're going to put together something on April 24. That's wonderful. Wonderful. I've been a part of it for a number of years. I've always said April 25 is just as important as April 24. And April 24 is not just one day, it's 365 days a year. It's a mindset, it's a lifestyle. If you don't stop to think, to feel, to act, to do something, to lift a little finger every day for your people, for your cause, your people will be one day less than your people. They will be minority in an oasis or an ocean of Babylonian uh, scrambled eggs of humanity. So what it's gonna take, it's gonna take leadership. It's gonna take putting aside petty differences. It's gonna take forgetting about arguing for colors, black or white, or whatever the case may be. It's gonna take shedding aside these ridiculous pro and con personalities instead of principles. Everybody knows what it's gonna take, but everybody's looking for somebody else to, to lead the way. Well, you know what? The social media certainly seems to have a lot of leaders, a lot of revolutionaries. I sure would like to see them, you know, while we spend our time here discussing things, I sure would like to see them on the trenches, not on social media, but the trenches that the three of us and many like us frequent on a daily basis. That's what's gonna take. So anyway, uh, uh, I have no questions. I I, um, I wanted to kind of wrap it up, Gato, with uh, with asking Adis just some just as a closing thought. You know, uh, best case scenario in the next over the next five years, what do you see happening with Armenian diaspora in in, in, in Turkey in particular? Um, given the political situation, what you know, what is what is what is your 
prognosis? What are you looking for? What are the, the uh, avenues that you're working towards? Um, and, uh, and, and I would just kind of a, get your big picture idea of where you think things are headed in Turkey for our, the Armenian community. Sure. Um, let's see that in, until 2023, it will be a hard time uh, because there will be elections in Turkey and uh, this government, the Erdogan is going to push as much as uh, he can even to be able to use uh, another uh, hate crime, which is, uh, we, which we, we don't know uh, until where he can go. Uh, we don't, we, we cannot expect, we cannot uh, see if it's just going to be a, it, it can be a ch church attack or a uh, or a uh, criminal act, uh, we don't know. We cannot uh, see that because he's uh, doing as whatever it, it takes uh, to keep the uh, power on him. For Armenians, it's going to be a hard time, but at the same time, mm, we have to use the opportunities that uh, we have in our hands now. For example, it's the first time that in the Turkish Republic that uh, an Armenian TV channel in Western Armenian language is granted in Turkey, in the uh, Turkish satellite. And uh, it's the, this, the, but at the same time, we don't see uh, state support to existing Armenian journals, daily journals. They're going to be uh, closed up uh, if, if we don't support them. So uh, what takes that, what I see is uh, they're trying to create their own community and own um, Armenian medias, or, uh, minority medias, even minority representatives and people uh, like every state wants. Every state wants and a minority leader who is close to him, which they're going to manipulate or tell what they do, whatever uh, they say. So this is going to be a hard time until 2023. But after, to, uh, after that, we're, we also have to consider ourselves to uh, spend much more energy uh, to rebuild the community uh, because there, when I'm uh, talking about rebuilding, I'm not just talking about Istanbul Armenian community. I'm talking about uh, people we, uh, who are not engaged in their Hemshina Hayer or their Sima Hayer and these old people uh, in Mardin, in their in uh, many uh, Western Armenian uh, cities, we have Armenians still there. We just have to know how to gather these people. Uh, I give so much importance on that because this national awakening is also not largening the diasporan uh, population. It's also giving sight and uh, other uh, ways to look uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the future. As I said, there are many more and more people going to Armenia from these cities, not to Istanbul. Before, the route was uh, coming to Istanbul and then Europe. Now, it, the route is Armenia. So that is a hope too. Uh, that is a hope too. Uh, that is the struggle that we have to continue. And in, in any case that human rights uh, violations, uh, that we, we should stay awake. Uh, and that is not just a struggle of Arme uh, Armenians in Turkey. Also, uh, that's a struggle of diaspora. And uh, as a diaspora member now for uh, last uh, maybe 10 years that I can say, I see uh, more the, uh, our problems in here. And uh, it's not for Europe, I can say that our problem is just not sending some uh, investment or money to Armenia. I'm always saying in here these meetings and people doesn't like it, but I will say it once again, we are sending support to Armenia, but we, we are investing in Armenia, but we are never talking to pay in European levels in Armenian factory. We are paying in Armenian levels. Mm -hmm. There are many, many uh, European companies investing in Armenia, European Armenians investing in Armenia and paying uh, $300, $500 uh, per month why you're not thinking to create a higher level economy if you're that much interested to invest. Mm -hmm. If we are interested in culture, let's go there and let's do it. This is the time. This is what we need. This is what Armenia needs, what Arsakh needs. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Um, and I hope that you're going to be back with us as we near the the elections in Turkey, because I, I know that your insights would be very much appreciated as the political climate heats up, particularly at this very interesting juncture. So thank you very much again for getting up so early in the morning for us. And with that, I want to ask Garo for his uh, for his final thoughts. Uh, thank you, Karnik. Uh, Aris, I want to thank you uh, for accepting our invitation. Uh, I couldn't think of a better way to spend uh, this evening and this morning in, uh, in Europe for you uh, than, uh, than with you uh, reminiscing uh, in some small measure uh, about all that brought you and I, many like us together, the spirit of Harant Dink and the spirit of Edwin Minassian who brought the spirit of Harant Dink to people like me. Uh, you know, when we talk about what's it gonna take, Karnik, and, and we talk, and I say it's gonna take leadership, it's gonna take uh, uh, unity, putting aside petty differences, keeping the eye on the target, on the mountaintop, I'm reminded that when I was growing up in Beirut, uh, there were people who were, who were iconic. There were people like Garo Sasuni. There were people like Moses Der Kalustian. There were people like Haraj Das Nabetian. There were people like Sarkis Zaitlian. These were men you know, who some had fought, one Moses Der Kalustian had been on the 40 days of Musada, literally, he had fought there. Um, then he was member of parliament in Syria, then in Lebanon, when, when the Syria-Lebanon division occurred uh, after the Second World War. These were role models and we need Today, we need each of us to think about becoming a role model to someone, one person. And we in turn also need to look for role models, but it's not one or the other, it's both. You need to be a role model and you need to look for role models. And in Turkey, uh, Hrant Dink was such a role model. He was such a role model for, model for peace, uh, for coexistence, uh, for humanity, for fairness, and he paid for it with his life. Um, you know, I remember when, when his assassin, the 17-year-old, was arrested, the Turkish gendarme were taking pictures with him with a Turkish flag, all smiles and all. But I like to often remind myself of another scene, a scene of 100,000 people walking in Istanbul and saying, we are all Herantink, we are all Armenians. Well, we are all in desperate need to be our own Herantink, our own Garo Sasuni, Sarkis Zeytlian, Haraj Nabedian, our own, our own Edwin Minassians. We are all accountable. We don't need to be spectators in the game of life because the game of life is not just a game. It has an end point, as we know. We've lost some of these giants because they've reached their end. Far too soon, if I might add. So where do we go from here? Well, the struggle and the march towards our objective must continue. It's far from over. It's not even halfway there. And, you know, are we going to be in for brighter days? When in doubt, as difficult as it may be, Arish John, you have to ask yourself, you have to tell yourself, what would Harant think say? What would Haran Dink do? And if you can't think of what else to do, then do what Haran Dink would have done. Kardik for you, Aris for you. I am Garo. Stay safe, stay fierce. Keep your eye on the ball. 
and let's get together next Tuesday evening in United States for front lines. Aris, answer your call. When we're off the air, we'll be calling you to chat a little bit more. Okay. That's it. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.